Hi there and welcome to Where's the Money Gone, a podcast about football finance, governance and politics with me, Adrian Goldberg. I'm an investigative journalist and West Bromwich Albion season ticket holder, joined as usual by Charlton Athletics Chief Executive Charlie Methan and a special guest, Joe Blott, Liverpool fan, former chair of Spirit of Shankly, Liverpool's Supporters Trust. We're going to talk to Joe because this week the government has said it would strengthen the Football Supporters Bill and it will, amongst other things, explicitly require clubs mm-hmm. to provide effective engagement with fans on changes to ticket prices and any proposals to relocate home ground. So we'll get stuck into that uh, before too long. As we speak, Joe, Liverpool haven't yet played. They've got a game later on against Arsenal. New manager in Arna Slot. Are you missing Jurgen Klopp or is this just the natural way of things and life moves on? Not as much as I thought I would be. Uh, obviously, the start that we've had this season has been incredible. Um, couldn't ask for anything else, could we, in, term, in terms of that transition from from Klopp, who is a unique one-off. Um, but I think, personally, I like, I like slot style. Um, I like his style in his approach to to the media and his approach to the way he, he, he manages himself. Uh, but equally, the way he manages the team at the moment, and I think... I don't think we can have too many complaints and I'm looking forward to the game this afternoon. And um, Charlie, you had, uh, I think you are playing Wrexham, 24,000 people in the Valley, fantastic attendance and a Hollywood ending because uh, Charlton equalised, didn't they? What, 90 plus 6, 90 plus 7? Yes, it's been a <clears throat> rather tumultuous week, Adrian. Um, on Tuesday, we were playing away at Oakwell, um, Barnsley uh, against Barnsley and they, um, well, we went ahead in stoppage time and then they equalised with the last kick of the game. Um, that made for a very long journey back down south. And then yesterday, um, in another very sort of end-to-end type sort of League One game, this time the boot was on the other foot and uh, and we equalised with the last kick of the game. Well, I'm casting my eyes in envy at both of you because you're talking about a thing I haven't seen very often at the Albion. Goals, <laughs> second successive Home nil nil draw and the third game in a row at home where we failed to score at all. So uh, moving swiftly on. Joe, I want to talk about supporters engagement, but I'll just divert to Charlie briefly because the football supporters bill is something we've talked about on this (coughs) podcast a lot over the months. And it's come back now in what the government says is strengthened form. And Charlie, before we talk about supporter engagement, one of the key issues we've spoken about previously is the role of the regulator in in ensuring that parachute payments are more evenly distributed down the leagues. That's something that the government has said the regulator will have a role in, which impacts on your club and my club and affects the whole pyramid of football. And they've also said that the regulator will no longer have to take into account the government's foreign policy objectives when it comes to allowing foreign ownership. These are two big things, I think, that the Labour government have signalled as the bill is brought forward. Yes, Adrian. Well, first of all, it's a football governance bill rather than the football supporters bill. And of course, supporter engagement plays a significant part within it. Um, And the safeguarding of the sport for future generations of clubs for future generations. I've I've been on the committee of a supporters trust and obviously Joe has um, also um, run a supporters trust and these this is basically what you know what we've been calling for for all these years all these decades which is some structural sanity to be brought um, to the game to make sure that clubs are not uh, clubs futures are not the whim of individual bad actors poor owners um, breakdowns in relationships and all this all these types of rather you know things that do come and go um, now if you break the bill down into two parts. Um, the first part of it, uh, let's say, is to do with um, sort of the the relationship effectively between um, the Premier League and the Football League, um, and particularly when it comes to distribution of TV monies. Um, and then the second part is uh, to do with supporter engagement um, and, and and all that and, and all that stuff. But what I propose to do, if it's okay, is to cover off um, the Premier League Football League bit first. Um, and maybe get your and Joe's view on that. Um, and then secondly, to move on to the um, mandatory forms of supporter engagement that we're going to see um, going forward. Um, so if we look at uh, 
the relationship between the Premier League and the, and the Football League. What we're really talking about here is the relationship between the top division and the other three divisions, right? So there has always been a financial arrangement between the four divisions of English professional football. Um, back when it was all the Football League, an era which I know you hop back to, Adrian, on a regular basis, um, there was a division of any collective monies that came into football, i.e. Um, sponsorship of the league, TV revenues, albeit in those days they weren't very great, etc. 75% of um, these monies went to the top division clubs and 25% went to the other three divisions. That might seem rather unfair, 75, 25. I mean, Christ, I mean, you know, 25% to share between 70, what was what was then around 70 clubs and 75 to share between the top 24 clubs back in those days, or actually would have been, been even fewer in the, in the bottom three divisions. That might seem unfair, but of course it's not because the real sort of driver for revenue has always been clubs like Joe's um, and Man United and, and so on and so forth, because that's... When you think about someone taking out sponsorship of the Football League, as it was back in those days, or the Premier League now, the Barclays Premier League, whatever it might be, the main draw for those uh, types of brands to associate with the Premier League is the very big clubs and the big matches between the big clubs, like Liverpool, Arsenal this afternoon, will have a vast global audience. And that's what justifies the huge sponsorship monies and TV monies paid by all sorts of different organisations. And therefore is why 75-25 was a fair and reasonable split. Now, what has happened since um, over the intervening decades is that, um, you know, in the first place, that was reduced down when the Premier League um, broke off. That was reduced down to somewhere between 12.5% and 15% um, to going to the bottom three divisions and the remainder going to the Premier League. So there was already a big sort of change that happened at that particular point in time. And then what happened is that the Premier League decided that actually, even of the rather meagre amount that was allocated to the Football League, they were now going to start apportioning a very large amount of that money in what we call parachute payments to those that small number of Football League clubs who have been recently relegated from the Premier League. Now, they say we are still giving that money to the Football League clubs. The Football League clubs say, well, I wish you wouldn't, because what you're doing there is basically destroying our competition by giving a vast amount of money to three or four clubs and almost nothing to the remainder of the clubs within the Football League. So to give you some idea of the scale of the problem, um, you know, a club like West Brom, um, which is now outside the parachute payment structures, receives around about £7 million in TV monies. Um, a club such as Leeds, which was more recently relegated than West Brom, will be receiving more like £50 million in TV monies. And yet the two clubs are supposed to compete against each other in the same competition and have a fair and even competition, etc., etc. So effectively, the Football League has been arguing for some time um, uh, that there should be a greater share of monies restored to the Football League clubs on the one hand, and that less of it, maybe even none of it, but certainly less of it should be apportioned to parachute payments. Um, and effectively, uh, the government um, has been saying for some time, um, look, you know, clearly there needs to be a change here. Um, it's incumbent upon the two parties to um, uh, come to an agreement between themselves and uh, what one which most parties would regard as being fair. And um, that is what the Premier League refused to do. They kept on coming up to meetings and having chewing their pencil and pushing bits of paper around the table, but ultimately failing to come to any kind of deal with the, with the Football League until last um, September, under the threat of this regulator being introduced, the Premier League executive said, OK, we do realise there's a problem. Here's a deal. And they put a deal in front of the Football League. The Football League took a draft vote on it. It was narrowly voted through. At which point, some of the Premier League clubs, not, I have to say, Liverpool, um, other Premier League clubs, let's say those with a slightly more narrow-minded view of their own self-interests, withdrew their support for that offer. And at that point, it became clear to everybody in the government, we're going to have to impose a regulator here because clubs, um, I, I won't go into detail necessarily about those which they are, but clubs in the bottom half of the Premier League are simply not going to be reasonable. They're not going to behave in a rational way. So when I see people saying, we don't need a regulator, what we might not have done, we might not have needed a regulator if two things had happened. One, if, the big, if, if some of the Premier League clubs had been more reasonable. And secondly, if the Football Association had been able to fulfil this function of being the intermediator, the mediator between the Premier League and the Football League. The problem is, 
The problem is, the sad truth is, the Premier League had bought the Football Association and had basically stuffed up all the main committees and prevented the Football Association from being an effective regulator. So there's a huge amount of hypocrisy and humbug from people who say, we don't need a regulator, we never needed a regulator. There was always meant to be a regulator, it was meant to be the Football Association. When one party within the industry effectively purchases the Football Association by making the Football Association dependent on its funding to do various different things, then that all falls apart. So that's, <clears throat> that's that side of it, which I think might be worth getting your views on now. I mean, come on to the fan bit later. Well, I want to talk to, I want to bring Joe in here, Charlie, because I think uh, we've talked about the parachute payments or the the division of money in football a fair bit. But Joe's got a real story to tell about fan engagement. And Joe, this store, <clears throat> and obviously this is a, a, a part of the football governance bill. Joe, your story started initially, Spirit of Shankly, out of the Hicks and Gillette rule at Liverpool, didn't it? When, like the Glazers at Manchester United, they had borrowed huge sums of money against the club and you as fans organised and felt, we've got to change something here. That's the origin, really, of of the spirit of Shankly at, at Anfield. It is, Adrian, uh, 15 years ago uh, that was taking place. And um, I think what Charlie sort of you know really highlighted there was that um, this sort of bubble that the Premier League operates in, um, you know, prior to that, we still had problems with the likes of Berry, with Cardiff, with Blackpool, um, with uh, Stockport, Reading, all of those clubs, you know, sort of fighting for survival. Um, and kind of the Premier League was just like letting it all drift away because we were all right, weren't we? Um, and I guess that's when it, the, the sort of the, you know, the light bulb of if this can impact um, on Premier League clubs, because when Hicks and Gillette came in, you know, to take us to win three within three days of bankruptcy um, for a Premier League club with the finances that that Charlie's just been talking about, with the with the heritage that he had, with the success it had, you know, from the seventies and eighties, etc. You know, if it can happen to Liverpool Football Club, I think everyone realised it can happen anywhere. Um, and I think what what we saw there was that um, the lack of control, the lack of uh, leadership, the lack of governance. Um, by any of the football authorities was was primarily evidence and it and it was really fans who who got together and really you know made the biggest noise uh, around it now um you know john henry's gone on record and said to to spirit of shankly with without you guys this wouldn't have happened um now he, he that might be a soundbite i don't know but the reality is is that that noise that was created by football fans was what really you know, ignited the media as well into doing that. Um, because before that, it was only when something was leaked from the Liverpool Echo to us about what was going on behind the scenes for Hicks and Gillette, uh, about the way that they were leveraging the club and borrowing and everything else that they were doing. Um, we didn't know about it. Now, how on earth can the FA, the Premier League, uh, and, all, and the other football authorities not know this? Um, or did they know? And they're just saying, well, it's just football. Um, and the, the reality is all of this comes down to whether we're talking about the 70s and the, and the sort of 75%, 25%, or we're talking about the, the now ridiculous, you know, uh, almost 85, 15% or, or even worse. Um, it just ruins competitive balance. And that's what football fans want. Um, they're not guided by the financial rules and regulations. You know, most of us don't understand it. Most of us turn up to the match at the Hawthorns, the Valley, at Anfield, wanting to see 90 minutes of football and, and, and being enthralled by it, whether it's a 96th minute winner or, or an equaliser or, or a loss. What goes on behind it? Many of us don't kind of get into that. And it's only when, you, when you're... A, in a supporters' trust environment or when you're at risk that you start to look at that. And, and, and yet... Here we are being managed and governed. It's it's our game. It's our heritage. Um, the future, the future, Charlie, you referring to in terms of you know children, grandchildren, and their grandchildren. You know, we want them to be there and enjoying all the things that we've enjoyed o over years. And 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 it's at risk. And and the, the the whole point comes back to is that sadly football can't govern itself, um, and that's the reality. And I want to fast forward now, Joe. I totally agree. I, I totally okay. agree with every single thing that Joe just said. And one of the most interesting things about the last few years 
has been the total solidarity of fans across all the leagues. So when we see certain Premier League clubs behaving in, frankly, a, a selfish and short-sighted way, what's been interesting is their fans do not do that. The fans want to see a competitive pyramid. Fans have got longer memories sometimes than the American owners who take over some of these clubs. Fans know that their clubs at times have been in different divisions, as Liverpool have been um, and as we have been. And we know, we know that our clubs can come under significant risk. You know, speaking from my own personal experience, when I was a young youngster, um, Robert Maxwell tried to merge Oxford United with Reading to form something called the Thames Valley Royals, which so Oxford, Oxford itself would no longer have a professional football team. It would play at Digcut. Um, subsequently, I was rattling buckets outside the manor ground to save the club in the mid-1990s. When you've been through these things, you, you, you get pretty emotionally, like, never again. This should never be allowed to happen again. So when we as fans, and I at this point, although I am a football club executive, I've definitely classed myself as a fan. When we as fans see owners playing fast and loose with clubs, other clubs, not even our own clubs, we feel total solidarity. And, and you'll see this happen when clubs are in trouble. Fans will feel total solidarity. But I just want to go on to the measures which are specifically being brought forward under the under the sort of auspices of the football governance bill, and sort of start to ask Joe and you, Adrian, um, as you know, people who have fans who have become interested in the finance of football, whether you think the measures introduced in this bill go far enough. Well, let, let me just interject there, Charlie, because I think it's important to fast forward on Joe's story to 2021, because this will take us to the whole question of football governance and what the bill might actually enact because joe following the arrival of fenway and john henry liverpool did start talking to the spirit of shankly you as a fan group as a supporters trust were in regular dialogue with the football club but you've told me that when the european super league was announced you even though you were in regular dialogue with the club I hadn't got the foggiest. It was a, a, as much a surprise to you as it was to every other Liverpool fan and every other football fan in the country. Yeah, I think you're right. I, th I, th I mean, interestingly, b even slightly before that, if you think about the conversation we've just been having about, about owners, so get rid of Hicks and Gillette at all costs, of course, but then it's also about be careful what you wish for. So so whilst, whilst FSG came, Fenway Sports Group came in and, and, and rescued Liverpool, at the same time, you know, they had their own agenda too. Um, so we also had a battle about they wanted to trademark the, na the name Liverpool. You know, what on earth? That, that, that's my home city. It's, you know, it it's, it's belongs to the city. It doesn't belong to a football club. Um, so they still flip flop along into, into these kind of, oh, let's try this, let's try that, let's try the American franchising model and all those kind of things that they're trying to do. But you're right, Adrian. You know, sort of on, on you know on the Friday afternoon, um, I had I had a meeting with the club. Great engagement about the issues that were facing us at that time. Sunday afternoon, my phone's going wildfire with with, with from Kev Miles at the at the Football Support Association to say, "Do you know what your club's up to?" And I thought, "Where's this come from?" Um, you know, forty eight hours. Um, I go. I was sitting in the room having it, having it. What I thought was a a really fruitful conversation about the future of Liverpool Football Club and what was happening at the time about, uh, for fans. Um, and then suddenly, uh, you know, we're now thrust into this situation about a European Super League that uh, has obviously been talked about a little bit longer than since Friday afternoon. Uh, it, I, I mean, no one knew about it. Um, we're coming, you know, back to Charlie's point about the fan solidarity. I mean. Never has there been, um, you know, such a such a solid response from fans um, to such a such an idea that than than this and that you know that afternoon, you know, it's, it's almost as like you know, you know the way they plan for the, you know the, the royal death, uh, and it's all it's all mapped out for what's going to happen. Um, we don't have that <laughs> as fans, but what we do have is is a collective viewpoint about what's good and what's bad in football. Um, so, you know, I was on the phone to colleagues from Tottenham, to Arsenal, Man United, Man City, Chelsea, um, who were all behind this. Um, and 48 hours later, you know, completely and utterly uh, dead in the water. But that's because of that solidarity. That's because of that unification of, of fans of knowing what's right and what's wrong. But ultimately, it was, it was about this competitive balance. It was about no club should be allowed to just join a, a, a 
a, a members club where you can't you can't access it. That's not what football's about. Football's about the best team over the you know however many games there are in a season. If you fall short of that, you fall short of it. You get relegated, you get relegated. You get promoted, you get promoted. If you win it, you win it. That's it. It's about the playing pitch and not the balance sheet. And that's what was really shocking about all of this, about the way that they've done it. Um, now, Liverpool will have us believe that only only a, uh, a small number of FSG knew about this. Uh, I'm being honest, I actually believe that. I I don't believe the local... FSG members were fully aware of it. I think this was very much a, uh, a kind of a John Henry uh, and he was talking to Juventus, talking to Real Madrid, talking to, to to those clubs about doing it. And actually he just thought it was okay and we'd just be able to do it. Um, because, again, Charlie's point about do, do some of these internationally, globally managed, whether they're nation states or whether they're uh, you know, financial houses or, or 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 whatever. Do they understand football? And the reality is they don't. They just see it as a business. Uh, um, so they don't understand the heart and the lifeblood that we go through as fans uh, in order to to, to maintain our, our club. And one one thing we were concerned about at the time. Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll pause to, <laughs> to let you come in. But one thing I, I would say is that. Because we'd been flip-flopping along, because we'd had Hicks and Gillette, because we'd had the trademarking issue, because Liverpool wanted to furlough their staff when they were in a multi-billion pound global business and yet they wanted to take government money during COVID. Um, Because of those kind of things, we wanted something positive to come out of this. So just ending the Super League couldn't be the end game. Um, And that's why we then embarked on having something that said, no, that engagement on the Friday afternoon was good but we want something that is not only good, we want it better, but we want it long lasting. And we also want it to be lasting beyond my lifetime, but also the lifetime of the ownership. Um, and that's why we got into a contract with Liverpool Football Club. It's written into the Articles of Association. Um, we we came up with the, the heritage type stuff, the moving from Anfield that need fan consent, the joining of a European Super League that needs fan consent. Um, and, and out of that came, I think, probably then the discussions with Tracy Crouch about the fan-led review. Um, now, I don't want to believe that we weren't the instigator of that, but actually I think we were probably a, a major player in it. Yeah, so we've got to the point, Joe, where I think this is really interesting, Charlie. Liverpool now, as a football club, through their articles of association, through the founding documents of the club, have to consult with fans on whether they join the Super League, on whether they ever move from Anfield. And hopefully, I mean, who knows, but hopefully now that is the basis of proper informed fan engagement. What does the football governance bill offer like that to supporters of every football club? Will it be a replica of that? Well, um, we don't quite know yet. What we do know is it's going to be mandatory um, for clubs to engage with democratically um, elected um, supporter organisations, right? Now, there's already something called <clears throat> structured engagement, which means that clubs are meant to demonstrate best practice in meeting with supporter groups a couple of times a year, three or four times a year. Um, And in the Premier League, that is, I believe, mandatory. In the Football League, it's best practice, etc. But that can be a very um, pusillanimous thing. Um, I've been part of it before. So some mid-ranking club executive sits around a table, a bunch of disparate groups, fan leaders come in, they have a bit of a moan about this, that, and the other. The fan, the, the, the executive takes some notes and says, I'll get back to you. And then a note of the meeting, a minute of the meeting is published and so on and so forth. Look, it's better than nothing, but it's not actually enough. Now, what Liverpool have done is moved to something much more structured and, as you say, institutional. And that's what we've done at Charleston. We recently announced the launch of a shadow board, um, which is a carefully thought through um, body, which we've been working with our supporters' trusts on for the last three to four months. And this is really trying to make sure that the that the shadow board actually has some authority and some real um, basis to it so that it's not just a talking shop and it's not something that the club can take lightly. 
Um, so rather than just being a whole bunch of different supporters groups or all getting together, disagreeing with each other and that type of stuff, what we've said is that they're going to be statutory positions on the board for members of CAST, that's Charleston Athletic Supporters Trust, um, positions on the board, statutory positions on the board for, for um, representatives of CACT, that's our community trust, which is the largest in the country, um, and for the former Players Association, um, uh, as well, so that all elements, all independent elements of the club, which are, um, are represented on this board and able to actually then um, discuss with me in this instance, because as chief executive, I then attend their meetings um, and I go there with um, a, an open book on terms of what what's happening at the club. You know what the numbers are. What you know what what are we trying to do? Um, what the costs are. Where, where our strategy is, etc., and they are then able to then mirroring the, the discussion which would happen at the club board, they are then having the same discussions about the same subject matters with the same information on the shadow board and are therefore able to send a representative, their chairperson, to the club board meeting where the shadow board can then say, right, we've had a look at these issues that you're looking at, this is our viewpoint on those matters, but it's being done so from the basis of having seen information. It's not just talking off the top of their head. They've actually able to see, see, see the information. So two things are going to happen there, Charlie, haven't there? One is you've got to have a football club with a good heart, with genuine intention to engage. And for this to be sustainable, it's got to be there beyond the lifetime, as Joe has said, of the current board, yeah. that particular board or owners of a football club. You've also got to have a group of people on the other side of the table who are going to respect confidentiality so that if you <laughs> share things about the club, you've got to be confident they're not going to be leaked to the South London press or appearing on fans' yeah. forums and so on. So... I can imagine a lot of owners bristling, and particularly if the regulator says that these fan advisory boards have powers over the admission price or have to be consulted over admission price. We saw Wolves fans kicking off in the summer over big increases to admission prices. I had a mate who went to see Nottingham Forest play Crystal Palace on a Monday night televised game, paying nearly 60 quid for a ticket. And we've talked previously about Fulham. Uh, and the the FSA have launched a stop exploiting loyalty campaign. We've heard about the attacks on concessionary prices for supporters. There are going to be owners out there who do not like this one little bit. Uh, well, th th that's true, of course. But um, the, the the reality of the situation is, is that you should consult with your supporters on ticket prices. But the supporters' leaders, who tend to be pretty smart, responsible people, need to be informed about the trade offs. Um, involved in this. So in other words, as a board, I would be saying to us, our shadow board, as a board representative of Charlton Athletic, I'd be saying, look, here is a bunch of stuff that we could do to increase revenue. Here's what would be done with that revenue. Um, you might very well advise us that it is not a good idea to raise revenue in that way or to raise ticket prices to increase revenue. But I'm here to tell you what the implications of that are. So you have to understand that if that's a route you want to go down, the team will be worse and the team will perform worse. Are you happy with that trade-off? And hopefully we then start to get slightly beyond this rather immature, childish debate, not even debate really, spat, where supporters want to have it both ways. We want cheap ticket prices and we want you to sign really expensive players, which I think is childish and immature and, and it, it sort of debases the whole currency of the relationship between clubs and its supporters. This is bringing supporters inside the tent and saying, what type of club do you want us to be? Because fundamentally, we exist as the administrators of the club to administer the club on your behalf. That's all we do. That is literally what we do. The two important parties here are the supporters on one hand and the players on the other hand. And effectively, we as administrators just sit between the players and the manager on the one hand and the supporters on the other hand and say, right, let's financially organise this in such a way that we can pay the players and the manager with money that's mostly coming from the supporters. Um, and and we hope to do that in a way that all parties can agree with. It's slightly different in a club like Liverpool, isn't it, Joe, where the owners might say, we're doing more than administrate the club, just perpetuating it from one generation to another. There will be people involved at many major clubs who are looking at it as a way to make money for them. Yeah, there's a cash cow in it there somewhere, isn't it? For however way you look at it, and you know FSG have got that because they 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 built 
they built the, the you know the, the club to a point where if it did sell it, it's a hell of a lot more worth a hell of a lot more than it was at the time. But yeah, they're not taking a dividend at this moment in time. Um, I mean, some of the stuff that 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 Charlie said there, you know, sort of rings rings absolutely true. I think, I think, from a fan perspective, though, there's a first of all that there has to be that dem democracy within the, the fan advisory boards. You, you're right, Charlie. I, I I can't just go and represent myself as a season ticket holder. I have to have a mandate from people behind me, I, I, and you're absolutely spot on with that. I think the reality then is is about how the, how you have that open relationship, and I think. I think for me, the fan advisory boards need to be just that, the clues in the title. And that needs to be run by fans. And I think the, the club needs to be facilitators and supporters of that. Um, your attendance is, is vital to that, or, or, or any other board member is vital to that. And the reciprocal arrangements about getting the message across from a fan perspective to, to board members is critically important. But I think when you come to issues like pricing, uh, um, there has to be that open and honest discussion about what it is because the problem with football isn't um, the revenue, it's the expenditure. Um, and that's the problem. So so Liverpool come to us and first of all, comes to your point, Adrian, about you know meaningful engagement. So they come to the supporters board on a Wednesday night and say, we're going to raise the prices by 2% on Friday. Well, that's not engagement. That's just telling us in advance and telling the the rest of the, the supporters that's nothing that that's ridiculous so fully behind charlie's point about this is this has to be you know you start your discussions in in december and build all the way through up to march to when you're announcing what you're going to be doing next season um i think the second element is is about what is it that they want from fans so two percent on liverpool's um fan base is about two million pound well Anywhere between six hundred and eight hundred million pounds of Liverpool's expenditure, so two million quid's absolutely nothing. So why why even go there with two percent? Um, it's meaning it's a drop in the ocean. You know, it's a Van Dyke's eyebrow or something. It's nonsense um, that, that 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 would happen. Then you have the surreptitious way you're talking about concessions and the way that they they want to reduce, you know, stop concessions so that. The, le the, the legacy fans, as they call them, actually no longer there because they want a throughput of new fans because it's exciting to watch the Premier League at this moment in time. But when it's not exciting to watch the Premier League in five years' time, those legacy fans aren't going to be there. And the 64,000 people who attend Anfield, that'll be back to 38,000 because we won't, be, we won't be going back because we'll have either gone to the City of Liverpool football club who are an independent club up or we just won't be going to the match anymore because they didn't want us then and they kind of don't want us now so there has to be that dialogue that says where is it we want to get to in five and ten years time what is it like to be a fan and it's not it's not about and I, you know i hate the term but it is true and people use the term tourists and I, I don't like that because i think tourists generate a lot of income for the football club for the city and everything else but their, their ambition to fly from Australia to Liverpool to watch one game is a fantastic ambition. And it's, wouldn't you just love to do that? But they're not going to be there this week. And they also want to be entertained. And Liverpool even market it as, come and sit in the Anfield Road stand. You'll get, you, you pay £150 or more for the ticket. You'll get a half-tied pie and a pint. And you can see the cop in all its glory. Well, I'm not a circus act. And you can come and watch me sort of parade in front of you. You're part of the atmosphere. You're part of the legacy. You're part of that growth that needs to be there for future years. Now, when Liverpool extended its stand by 9,000 seats, only 1,000 went to season ticket holders. And that's because they can max out on 8,000 other tickets on a week-in, week-out basis. Because I, as a season ticket holder, and you guys as season ticket holders, don't bring anything really to match day revenue apart from your your thousand pound at the start of the season. So all of those conversations have to be out there as a as a proper and real conversation. That Charlie, you said the right word. Then there's going to be a trade off. Then and how do we have that conversation about a trade off? Because yeah. I might be more willing to to say I don't mind at sixty five years old not having a concession if it, if a, if a ten year old kid can get in. For ten pound, 
that's a fantastic trade off for me. That's what makes the, that that's that's the future then. Yeah, and in my experience, um, when you start having these proper mature adult conversations, um, fans and particularly the leaders of fans group are you know intelligent, balanced people who, once the trade offs are laid out in front of them, are able to take them back to their, their members and say, "Hey, look, you know, we've had a sensible conversation with the club. Um, you know, this is what it means." Um, you know, so it's, it's not, it's, I don't think this is impossible. I think the clubs running away from this don't understand the potential benefits of it. Um, and, and they will find out those shortly. I just want to just go, go back on the original thing, which is, is to do with the, um, the relationship between, um, the Premier League and the rest of the Football League and what's going to happen next, Adrian, just very briefly. What, what is going to happen next, obviously, is that, um, the, the Premier League need to digest the fact that now, if they do not come to an agreement with the Football League, one is going to be imposed upon them and that that will include potentially um, either the abolition or reduction of parachute payments. Now, it's, the, the arrogance of the organisation means it's going to take a little while for the owners of the Premier League clubs to fully digest what the reality of that situation is. But you'd imagine at some point, probably post the Man City debacle being settled, that there will start to be meetings again between the Premier League and the Football League at which the arguments will start to be put back on the table around what fair distribution should look like. And we're not talking about just moral fairness. What we're talking about here is trying to create a competition that all the fans want to see, right? So what Joe said earlier on about we all want to see a balanced competition, which doesn't... Obviously, Liverpool is still a much bigger club than West Brom or Charlton. Liverpool will still beat West Brom and Charlton the vast majority of the time. The question is, is there any chance at all for West Brom and Charlton to compete against Liverpool in the future. And most Liverpool fans, the answer that we, well, we, yes, that's what we want. We don't want to be separated off into some totally different universe. You know, if you speak to big club fans, they never wanted that, which is why they were so, so opposed to the Super League. The difference will be this time is that once the Premier League bosses get around the table with the Football League bosses, the Football League bosses this time will have leverage. This time that they'll be able to say, if there's some horrible strings attached, which make it even easier for big clubs to poach smaller clubs, players and all that type of stuff, the Football League bosses will say no. They'll just be able to say no, we'll wait for the regulator to, to make his determination if, if that's the way it's going to be. So it'll enable a much more grown up conversation between them. And hopefully they will come to an agreement before the 18 months are up in terms of when the, when the determination will be made by the regulator. And hopefully during that time, clubs up and down the country will institute the types of structured um, fan engagement that Liverpool has and that Charleston now has. Um, and by the time that all these the regulators is in place, in a way, football will have got its house in order. But let's be under no illusion, none of that would have happened unless the government had said that there is going to be a regulator. That is the stick which is making bad actors fall into line. Great to hear from you always, Charlie. Thank you, Charlie Methon, Chief Executive of Charlton Athletic. And thank you to Joe Blott as well, former chair of the Spirits of Shankly Liverpool Supporters Trust, which is instituted, I should let you know, as a trade union. Very interesting and fantastic achievements by that fan group to get proper fan engagement at Anfield. I'm Adrian Goldberg. This episode has been produced by me and Jed Thomas. Thanks also to 1129 and Mark Machado for their work on our visuals. Don't forget to hit subscribe if you're watching us on YouTube or listening via your favourite podcast stream. And don't forget to check out my Substack, adriangoldberg.substack.com for more on this sort of stuff. We'll see you again very soon. But for now, thank you. Goodbye. Cheers. Thank you.